I'm Annie, the HR intern, and I helped spearhead this um, workshop series this summer. Uh, and I'll give a quick introduction of our speaker today, Jason Boys. Jason supports the full range of career and student services for the School of Labor and Employment Relations. Uh, some of his duties include serving as a contact for prospective and admitted students. Uh, most of his work is very student facing and he assists with onboarding new grad students, et cetera, et cetera, uh, recruiting, career coaching, um, and he's really good at presentations. So go ahead. Thanks, Annie. I'll let them determine if I'm really good at presentations or not, but uh, <laughs> I do talk about presentations some, so we'll just say that much, but uh, yeah, so thanks. So thank you a lot. It's great to be here um, and be talking with you all. I'm going to go through a presentation that I actually do um, for uh, my grad students as they're starting the program to help them get ready for presenting in the workplace. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now. So we can get the slides up. Does that look good? Everybody can see that? Yeah. So um, we'll just go ahead and start here. So like I said, we're going to talk a little bit about fundamentals of presenting in the workplace. Um, it's, you know, a lot of this is pretty true across public speaking, um, regardless of where you are, or where you're doing it. Um, but I know that a lot of you have in mind your um, kind of report out presentations um, and, and things like that from your internships. Um, I can't really, I am going to ask you to kind of drop some comments in the, um, in the chat box, I actually doesn't look like I can see it with the slideshow up. So I want to have Annie kind of tell me um, an idea of how um, people are responding. First off, um, if you uh, have an upcoming presentation for your current position um, that you know is coming, maybe at the end of the summer or something like that, a report out, will you just comment in the comment box that you do? Just a yes if you have a a presentation coming up so we can get an idea and then Annie can you tell me if it looks like there's a lot of um, yes is going in the in the in the chat yeah of course it looks like I can bring it up here on the side okay yeah you can see it yeah I think I can see it I think this is gonna work okay a couple yeses anybody else okay next question and I'd like everyone to answer this on a scale of one to 10, how nervous are you at the idea of speaking in public, of doing a, a presentation? And this is just, uh, just to kind of get a feel for the room or where you all stand. So one to 10, um, one to three, meaning like you don't get nervous at all speaking in public. Um, you know, four to five, you get a little bit nervous. Um, you know, we'll say like nine and 10 is, you know, you're just, uh, scared to death to, to, to do public speaking, to present in front of a group. So let's see what you got. So some sixes. Depends on how well prepared you are. Glad you said that. That's exactly my, some points I'm going to be making. Okay, a lot of mid-range here. Okay. Depends on the topic. So a lot of mid-range, not seeing anyone um, extremely comfortable, um, mostly not seeing anyone too uh, terribly freaked out. So that's good. So that's good. Okay, so we'll kind of go with that. So we, we realize that a lot of us are, you know, you know, it's kind of inevitable, you know, you have to present from time to time. Um, some of you, you have impending presentations for projects you're working on right now. Um, so hopefully some of this will, will be able to help. So um, just a little bit about me, um, as Annie said, Jason Boys, Associate Director at the School of Labor and Employment Relations. Uh, if you don't know what LER, the Labor and Employment Relations is, we um, have a, we're a grad only school focusing on a master's of human resources and industrial relations degree. Uh, so it's a three semester master's program in HR. Uh, we also have a small PhD program. Um, so I always like to plug if anybody, if that sounds interesting to anyone, feel free to you know, contact me afterwards and I can tell you more about the program. Um, but our students, as you can guess, especially in their HR internships, almost entirely have um, presentations where they have to report out at the end of their at the end of their internships. I know that most of you pretty much everyone has those class presentations. Um, those can be nerve wracking uh, and stressful, of course. Um, but um, the the workplace presentations um, can require even some extra practice, uh, some extra time spent on these things. Um, because you know, you're a lot of times presenting in front of 
uh, maybe VPs in the area that you're working on, your bosses, your direct supervisors, their supervisors, uh, and it can be an intimidating space. So what I kind of argue is that the more prepared you are, which I know someone commented on this in the, in the box, um, the, the better off uh, you'll be going into it. The more comfortable you'll be, the more comfortable you are, the better presentation you'll ultimately end up giving and the more effective it'll be. So we're gonna talk more about actual preparation for presenting um, over, you know, actually how to like set up your speech or the format or things like that. This will be a lot more about prep. So please um, feel free. Oh, and I should mention the, the reason that I kind of got into this. Um, I actually, as a grad student, taught public speaking for several years. Um, I saw the, you know, the effects that um, some, some formal training on this can have and how much people can um, adjust and, and end up doing better and being a lot more comfortable uh, if they do the right preparation and, get, and, and, and do the practice the way they should. Um, so, you know, it's a topic that interests me and it's something that I've kind of, um, even now that I don't formally teach on the, the topic of public speaking, um, have been able to use some of those skills that I gained there to, to, to help people in positions like yours. Um, feel free to ask questions. So Andy's going to monitor the chat box, jump in. I'll try to allow some breaks. I can see the chat box now. I'll try to keep an eye on that. But Andy, if you could help me with that too. Um, and then, uh, you know, we can kind of pause and, and answer any questions or you can you can ask at the end, uh, whatever, whatever works best for you all. We'll be watching for your, your questions. Okay. Did this? Okay, sorry. So a few things here we're just gonna to touch on. Um, has anybody, if you just wanna comment, um, yes, in the chat box, has anybody taken a formal public speaking course as an undergrad here? Have you taken kind of an entry level public speaking course? I'm assuming several of you have. No's and yes is coming in. Interesting enough, where I um, used to teach public speaking was at the University of New Mexico. That's where I did my, um, my, my master's degree. Yes, yeah, so mixed bag here, yeses and no's. The reason that they hired so many TA, so many grad students in the communication department uh, to teach public speaking was because every student uh, at every undergraduate student at the University of New Mexico was required to take public speaking. So in the communication and journalism department where I did my master's degree, we had about 80 to 90 units or classes of public speaking every semester. It was just a massive operation of, of public speaking courses. Um, kind of funny enough, the um, one group of students who weren't required in the entire campus to take public speaking were students in the Department of C Communication. Uh, where the class was was offered. So we were the only ones that didn't have to take it. Uh, kind of assumed that that was just because they realized that we were getting a lot of training on things like this along the way. Um, so for those of you that have taken the, the classes before, you've probably seen some of this stuff. Um, there's different types of presentations so we're going to talk through and then kind of pick which one we think um, is most likely the one that you'll be using for a workplace presentation. Uh, manuscript speaking, is basically just like it says. I mean, it's from a manuscript. It's a written script that you as the speaker are um, you know, reading from. Um, these have, uh, I don't know if anybody wants to weigh in, anybody guess like pros and cons of these. As we talk through these, if you wanna throw some comments up here, um, that'd be great. Um, for example, you know, pros of manuscript speaking is that you're going to hit all of your points um, you're going to, uh, you know, get everything across that you were hoping to. It'll stay organized. You don't have to worry about forgetting anything. Anybody want to guess what a, a con of manuscript speaking might be? Stiff sounding. Exactly right. So it just comes across as stiff. It kind of comes across as staged and even fake. I think that, you know, when I think of manuscript speaking, the first thing that comes to mind for me is politicians. Uh, you know, a lot of the, the, the speeches that um, politicians or political figures when they're getting up on that podium, a lot of times they're reading directly from manuscripts. Um, news anchors and things like that, that tends to be, you know, teleprompted and they're kind of reading. I think we've all seen jokes in movies or shows where they've like, somebody goes and messes with the teleprompter and the, the um, news anchor is just reading exactly what's on there. Yeah, thanks. Looks less natural from Cherish here. Uh, hard to do eye contact. That's a great one. Yeah, exactly. Um, so on the opposite side of that, I'm going to go ahead. I'll start with the pros, but if anybody knows of any cons for memorized, 
go ahead and throw them in the chat box. Um, pros of memorized look actually, it's, it's kind of the opposite of this, right? For the pros, they can come across as very natural. It's easy to engage um, with, the, with the audience. Um, it's easier to make eye contact, um, things like that. Uh, on the con side, if you're trying to do a memorized presentation, you obviously have to have it all really, really well memorized. And I will say this from um, several, several years, several semesters, uh, difficult to prepare yet, from several semesters of, of watching people give um, public, you know, like speeches in a classroom, if they try to over memorize and they forget something, it's really hard once you go off the rails and forget something, it's easy to get really thrown off, um, really confused, um, and, and, and just, you know, you're flustered and scattered and, and kind of hard to bring it back. So I think that I've had a lot of students who have said uh, their goal was to actually go home and memorize um, the speech and they were going to come back and give it. And I would not encourage this. I always encouraged, you know, having some cue cards, um, having some notes on the cards, uh, not writing the entire script, um, but, but being, you know, prepared and not just depending completely on your memory, because when that goes wrong, it can go really, really wrong. Uh, what do we have here? Hard to be reactionary to the audience. Delivery can sometimes, should change depending on body language of the audience. Exactly. So, um, Cherish, that's a great point. So, like, it's really hard to respond to that natural feedback that you're getting from the audience uh, if you have, have your um, speech memorized. And then again, once you kind of have to veer from it to react to the audience or respond, it's hard to pick up right where you left off and get that right. So that brings us to the third um, style of presentation, which I see as kind of a combination of the top two, which is uh, extemporaneous. So most likely in a presentation that you're gonna give in the workplace, you're gonna go with an extemporaneous style speech. That, ten, that typically just means um, that it's planned, but not memorized. So of course you have uh, some type of visual aid to help you uh, if it's note cards. I'm delivering an extemporaneous presentation right now to you all. I'm using my own slides kind of as my guide um, to keep me on, on track, um, but then I'm expanding on it where I think is appropriate. And yeah, I mean, it's a little weird now, right? We're doing everything virtually, but you know, in, in person, um, probably be a little more conversational. I'd be able to interact with the audience, hear your questions, pick up on your feedback, pick up on what you're agreeing with, what seems to be maybe tripping you up or confusing you a little bit and rolling with it. But I still have the structure in place to keep me on track and keep me focused. So that's what I'm doing right now. That is, <clears throat> almost undoubtedly what you'll do uh, in workplace presentations. Of course, you have your, your data, your numbers, your plan, your arguments, all of that in place, most likely using a slide deck, a PowerPoint presentation to deliver that, um, but be able, be able to react and ad adapt, be conversational and be a little more present in the moment. If things get messed up, if you get off track, so field some questions that you weren't expecting, anything like that, it's easy to pull it back um, and get back where you need to be with this style of, of presentation. And then of course, an impromptu speech. Um, you know, I think that we do this more than you think. I mean, even if you're in class and you decide to give an answer to a question or bring up a discussion point, um, you know, we might not think of that as being a presentation, but really it is. I mean, you're presenting an idea, um, a thought, a concern, uh, and you're kind of talking about it um, without having prepared for it ahead of time. Um, so that's one example of impromptu speeches. I highly doubt that when you're giving a, you know, one of your formal uh, workplace presentations that it's going to be impromptu. But at the same time, um, I know that a lot of us can attest to this. I know Jenny can. You're sitting in a meeting and you're, the, the meeting goes on to a, a topic that you happen to be an expert on, something that you're working on. You weren't expecting for the conversation to go there. Uh, but then someone kind of calls on you uh, and says, Jenny, uh, you've been working on this or you know about this. Can you tell us what you know? And then boom, all of a sudden you're giving a, an impromptu uh, presentation, brief as it may be, um, uh, just on, on a topic area that you have. Yeah, happens all the time. Yeah, I mean, all the time. And that's those are the times when you don't want to be caught uh, daydreaming or thinking about something else and then somebody calls on you uh, 
and ask you to, to weigh in on something and, and they, they caught you. So that happens sometimes from time to time too, but uh, hopefully you're paying attention and are ready to roll and talk about what they wanted to talk about. As we go through these, feel free, like I said, to, to drop any questions in the box um, and we can kind of talk through them as we go, okay? So otherwise I'm gonna kind of keep moving on. Okay, reasons to present. If anybody wants to drop any examples of any of these in the chat box, I'd appreciate it, okay? To entertain, anyone have any ideas uh, of some type of speaking engagement? that might be to entertain. There's tends to be one that comes to mind all the time. So anybody want to take a guess? Speaking at a wedding, that's it. Yep, Brian, <laughs> stand up. Oh, that's a good one, yeah. You know, stand up, that's an interesting one. I, I tend to think that that, oh no, that is, that is to entertain. Sorry, I was going back to my last points on which style of speech that is, which I guess that'd be extemporaneous. Um, but yeah. I always get the wedding example, right, to entertain. The toasts at weddings, those are really good ones. Tend to be, tend to be extemporaneous style. They've written some notes on they're giving them. Um, stand up, of course, that's a good one. Uh, probably extemporaneous too. Uh, actually, I guess that's oftentimes memorized, right? Like they're kind of going, know the routine. That seems terrifying to me um, to be able to do, to stand up there and just have that planned out with no notes um, in front of you. Um, yeah, to educate, that's another uh, reason to present, of course. Okay, so to inform is another reason to present. Uh, it's what I'm doing right now. It's what I'm, um, what you'll be doing a lot of times in your workplace presentations. It's what you're doing in classroom presentations. So um, informative speaking is extremely um, common, right? To persuade, now to persuade would mean to you want to kind of try to change someone's mind or get them on board um, with something uh, that you're you know that you're planning a project you're working on and you're trying to get the rest of the team on board or to understand it so they'll come along and, and be supportive of it so i would argue that a lot of these are actually it's a combination so it's not just um it's not all just black and white right like to entertain to inform to persuade um a lot of the presentations that you might be giving uh, in the workplace, of course, you are um, informing your, maybe your, your VP, your boss, um, some engineers, uh, whoever it might be that you're talking to, but you're also trying to convince them that your ideas or the work that you've done uh, is good work and it's a good idea and maybe it's something that they should implement in the future. Uh, maybe you're presenting on some type of a process that you think will improve um, the office or the place where you're working and you want them to agree and go with this. So while there's going to be a lot of information given and it's probably backed in data and, and all of that, uh, ultimately you're trying to persuade. So and then, you know, at the same time, you're trying to connect with your audience, trying to get to know them, trying to tell them a little bit around the background where you're coming from. So there's some entertainment value in there as well. So I do think that these aren't just cut and dry. Um, it's a combination. I think probably the, the, the biggest combination that you're looking at in workforce um, present, presenting uh, is, you know, informing and, and persuading. But I would also argue that public speaking or making a presentation is always to drive change, okay? Almost all the time, I mean, barring maybe your, your wedding um, uh, toast or something like that, which are pretty strictly entertainment, you're trying to drive some type of change, whether it's just um, helping someone be more informed on the topic, um, getting them to agree with the idea or the process that you're giving them, or whatever that might be, all right? there's some level of change that you're hoping comes out of it. I think that that's the case for me right now. I'm really hoping that by sitting and listening to this conversation today uh, in this presentation, that you're gonna be more comfortable uh, going into your next workplace presentation. All right, so hopefully I've changed your outlook on it, your anxiety around it, um, and your, your method of preparation. Um, so that means that there's power in that too. So we always have to understand that we're responsible for the information that we're offering. Um, we're responsible for the, the audience's time. Um, they're there for a reason, all of that. So anytime you're driving change, or res there's responsibility. We'll get to that a little bit more, uh, but always keeping that in mind, that you're kind of in a, you know, a place of, of power and responsibility when you're in front of a group. Any questions or thoughts on anything?
please, uh, again, just feel free to send them my way. We can probably just handle them as we go. All right, so preparation is key. Now this is where we're gonna start spending some time. Again, I argue that the more prepared you are going into a presentation, the better the delivery is gonna be and the easier it is to achieve your goals with the presentation. You're gonna prepare, that's gonna make you feel more comfortable, that's gonna help you show authority on the topic when you're in front of the audience and it's gonna help you deliver a strong presentation, and then it's gonna have the desired effects that you want. So what we're gonna talk about just for the rest of the time here is just ways that you can help yourself get ready to step in front of the audience. Now, I will say that I, I use this talk um, for those of you who um, are, I know a lot of you have secured your internships for the summer, but you're back on the job market. For those of you that are interviewing for anything now, a lot of the information that I give when I talk about preparing, um, just the same thing, the more confident you are, the better your delivery will be. I think that that all crosses over um, to resume, or uh, I'm sorry, interview preparation as well. So a lot of this I take, you could almost interchange the concept of how to prepare um, for, for job interviews and use it there. Because uh, of course, that's the, the, same, the same idea, right? Like you're presenting yourself and your knowledge um, and your kind of achievements and, and experiences uh, to an interviewer. All right, so, so keep that in mind, just uh, kind of as an aside as we go through this. So the first thing that I uh, like to talk about is the context of the situation. And we'll go through um, different items that kind of make up the context as we go. Um, but I think that, you know, kind of understanding context and then trying to do your best to um, get as much information around the context that your presentation is going to reside in uh, really can help you feel more comfortable walking in. So to give some examples, um, let's say that uh, there's, I don't know, in, and say yes if you've happened to have heard of this. If there's any communication majors uh, in the, on the call, they've probably heard this. Um, so just a yes, if you've heard of the sender message receiver model of communication. I'm just curious if anybody's heard of this. What it is, is it's basically a very kind of pretty straightforward, but important model of communication in that in, in any communication, in any interaction, you have a sender, okay? You have a receiver, and then between them, you have the message, which is being delivered in some form of, in some channel, um, and then hopefully you're getting feedback from the audience. So it's kind of a feedback loop, sender, receiver, the message and the feedback kind of looping between them, okay? And then all around are all the other elements that make up or could possibly distract and break down the delivery of that um, message in any way, and we call that noise, all right? So it can be literal noise, okay? Like literal distractions. Um, okay, somebody, yeah, I've heard of, the, heard of it in the marketing presentation, good. Um, we, we can have like literal distractions, literal noise, um, or, um, you know, just things that are going on that might break down any part of the delivery. I mean, even things going on in our, in our heads, um, any really, it's, could, it's any kind of distraction, okay? So typically, if we were in a, in a classroom or something, I kind of draw this out, but just try to imagine that loop. The sender, the message being, um, you know, delivered through some medium to the receiver, the receiver offering feedback, and then this noise, anything going on, and all of that is happening within a particular context. So that's the point I'm trying to get to, is that it's all within a context, all those pieces, and the more that we can understand every one of those pieces, who the sender is, that's you, so what level of information you have on the topic, who the receiver is, what the message is gonna be, which is the presentation, how it's gonna be delivered, okay? A lot of times that's gonna be in person. For example, right now we're doing this over Zoom, we're doing it virtually. Um, and then what there could be to, to cause distractions. So like for an example, I'll run through this quick. Let's say that I planned on doing this presentation for you all today at home, but then my Xfinity um, internet is down. I call up Xfinity to see what's going on. It's a couple hours before the presentation. Customer service isn't great. I'm kind of arguing with them and they're saying that they think it's something wrong on my end, but I know it's not. 
Um, that doesn't go well. The call ends unresolved, so I'm frustrated. Um, so I decided I got to hurry up, pack up my stuff, get to my office, come over here, um, set up to give this presentation. Uh, had to drive over. I'm a little behind schedule because I wasn't planning it, but we get things rolling, right? I'm giving this presentation. So I'm the sender, right? I'm giving the presentation. I'm still a little flustered and distracted. Um, giving it over the over Zoom. Now you're at home, the receiver, you're having some internet issues that I don't even know, right? Um, and so you're missing some ends of sentences that I'm saying, and that's kind of, you know, messing with your ability to really take all this on and understand all my points I'm making. Um, but then I go ahead, I get it delivered, you know, I think, I don't think I did the best job I could have done because I still have all this other stuff on my, in my mind from my, um, you know, frustrating morning, uh, changes of plans, things like that. All of that is the context. Okay. So every piece of that, that you can understand, uh, is better for you as the, as the speaker. So just thinking that through. So some things, uh, that we can consider for context are, as I've listed here on the, on the spread or on the, the PowerPoint is the space that we're, going to be delivering the speech in? Is it a classroom? Is it a large space? Do I need a microphone? Uh, will, you know, just understanding the amount of people, the size of the audience will help you get a better understanding for how you need to, to, to prepare. Um, the order of events, are you speaking first? Are you speaking last? Are you speaking in the middle? Are you speaking right after lunch? Um, do you need to kind of, <laughs> wake them back up um, after, after a heavy launch, or is it the 9 a.m., which is kind of the sweet spot where people are gonna be pretty in tune and pretty focused uh, and, and they're with you. So kind of considering that. Thinking ahead of time about technology, I think that one of the things that can trip up a presentation the most and set it off kind of on a bad foot is not understanding the technology um, that's gonna be be used and then getting there and having some issues and you have to call tech services. Um, Any time that you could get information on this ahead of time with whoever's you know coordinating the presentation, uh, if it's not you, what are, what kind of tech are we going to have? Do I need to bring a laptop? Uh, is there going to be a computer in the room? I mean, these are questions that we ask a lot here on campus uh, in the classrooms. Will there be microphones? Will somebody be there to help me do it, or do I need to show up early to make sure? Uh, that I can get it together. Can I go to the room the day before? I mean, this is something that I try to do if I can go somewhere a little early and just get a feel for what's going on with the technology. Um, I'm sure I'd be surprised if none of you in the crowd here um, have, you know, started to give some type of a presentation and had hangups with the, with the technology that can really throw things off. Um, the, the style, your style and comfort level. So again, it doesn't really matter what that is. It's just you trying to be understanding of how comfortable you're going to be. Do you need to give yourself some time once you arrive at the location to kind of be by yourself, take some deep breaths um, and, and get yourself kind of centered and ready? Do you know that you're just ready to roll? So just thinking these things through, asking the questions and knowing uh, what you're walking into will go a, a really long way. And again, I think that a lot of this carries over to interviews. The more you know about who's going to be interviewing you, where you are, and you know the realm of the interviews they'll be doing, um, the the space, the who it is that's going to be in the room with you, all of that. So just going through, asking the questions, knowing it and understanding it as you present your uh, as you prepare your presentation will be helpful. And then, of course, I mean, everything that, you know, I always taught as a, as a public speaking instructor is all extremely audience centered. So really trying to have an idea of who's going to be in the room. So, sorry, I keep having a weird delay here. Okay, staying audience centered. This is really, really important. And this goes back to the same. This are, these are the types of questions that you want to ask and stuff that you want to try to know ahead of time. The audience's knowledge of the topic. Having an idea of that is huge. Um, I don't know, I'm sure, if I, would, I would be asking you if we were face to face here, uh, why you think that's important, but I'm just gonna kind of go ahead and say it. Um, understanding their knowledge of the topic, it's very easy to talk over their head, because now say you're presenting on a project that you've been working on all summer. A lot of that information has just become second nature to you. You know it inside and out, and it's great, right? That's why you're prepared to give this presentation.
but you start giving it, you don't know exactly who's in the room and how much they know about it. You can't just start throwing around jargon on the topics and acronyms and things like that that other people might not understand. Um, at the same time, you don't want to, for lack of a better term, dumb it down too much because then what happens? Then they can actually become offended, right? Like you're kind of insulting their intelligence and making it too simple and too basic for the audience, all right? You also want to understand their interests of the topic, how much they actually care. Are these people just kind of forced to be in the meeting or do they have a vested interest in the topic? Their perspective on the topic, um, do they mostly, do you mostly think that they're going to agree with you and go along with it? Or are there people in the room who are basically pitching the opposite side, right? The opposite side of the argument. That's fine if that's the case, absolutely fine. But you want to know that walking into it, the homogeneity of the audience, maybe it's a mix of all of this. I'm just saying, like, do they all have a similar level of knowledge on the topic? Do they all have a similar level of interest, a similar perspective? Or is it all over the place? Maybe you have some folks in the room who know more about it than you. OK, and you have some folks in the room who have never heard or thought about the topic um, that you're bringing up and they're both sitting there. So you've got to cover all of that. That's great. That's challenging, but it's totally doable. But knowing it ahead of time is going to go a long way. So again, these probing questions with the coordinator are things to think about um, are really what the audience knows and where they stand on the topic. Questions, anyone? Okay, prepping the presentation. This is about as far into the actual prep of the presentation um, that I go. Okay, so this is um, some things that you can really think through to have a solid presentation um, and to really know where you stand on the topic and what the points you hope to get across and what you hope to engulf or the goals you hope to achieve. So uh, interactional goal, just think this through, write it down on paper. This is just for you. But what do you hope will happen as a result of this presentation? For me, it's I hope that all of you get a couple pieces of information that can inspire you to prepare more, will help you prepare more, know some, you know, have some ideas of what to think about going into a presentation, and that will ultimately make you more comfortable and a better presentment, presenter. Your commitment statement, okay, examines the interactional goal along with your position on the subject. So you have your interactional goal, but then also deeply understanding where you stand on the topic. Do you truly think that it's a big, a good idea what you're talking about? Is it change that you're driving or is it something that you're still exploring and thinking about and you're not taking a hard stance one way or another? That's fine but you need to understand what you hope to get out of it and how you feel on the topic uh, and then combine those two and think about them together. And then of course your responsibility. I mentioned this before, but we have a major responsibility um, in giving these presentations. And what is your responsibility uh, to the audience? People are busy. People are there for a reason. You're here for a reason right now. And that was to get some ideas around presenting in the workplace. My responsibility is to make sure that this is worth your time and that I'm talking on the top the topic pr promised, right? It's also um, my responsibility to get you out of there and get you done when um, I said I would get you done because their time is also your responsibility, okay? So again, this information, these, these kind of prep questions that you can ask yourself are really there just for you, just for stuff for you to consider uh, going into the presentation. And then, of course, I have one bad joke for everybody, okay? This is not going to go over well uh, via um, Zoom, but I decided to leave it in here anyway, uh, just because I think it's funny. So this is like an old, this isn't even a dad joke. This is like a grandpa joke. I don't know if anybody's ever heard this joke. You can raise your hand if you have, but don't say the answer. So there's this world famous cellist, right? Like plays the cello better than anyone. He's been practicing since he was like four years old, uh, just learning it. And now um, he's just like traveled the world, um, known as being such a great cellist everywhere. And finally, he gets the invitation to perform the cello at Carnegie Hall. For those of you that don't know Carnegie Hall, it's this super iconic concert venue um, kind of a epicenter of classical music 
uh, and, and, and other music uh, in kind of midtown Manhattan. So right in New York, um, very famous music center. So finally, this, this, this man, he, all of his dreams come true, and he's been invited to play at Carnegie Hall. All right? You with me here? So he flies in. He's from Europe. Flies in. Stays, you know, in, at a hotel in Brooklyn the night before. Plans on getting up early, driving to Carnegie Hall uh, the day of the, the concert um, to set up and rehearse and all that stuff. So he, he rents a car, drives, he's driving to Carnegie Hall, and he just gets horribly lost, right? Horribly lost. So he, um, he's driving around. It's getting closer and closer to time. He's getting really nervous, doesn't know New York. Um, so finally, he sees a gas station. And he pulls into the gas station and he asks the attendant, excuse me, sir, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? And the gas station attendant looks at him and says, practice, practice, practice. Okay? Super awkward because I can't even hear you not laughing at my bad joke. The thing that no one wants to do is practice, practice, practice. Okay? You can take all the time in the world and uh, get your presentation ready and do all these steps, but you've got to get in there and uh, actually, and actually say it out loud. It's the part that people tend to want to tiptoe around, but I'd say that it is the most important piece. Okay, so you've done all of this this work. You've looked up your, um, you've done all the work figuring out the context, figuring out your audience. You have all your data. You're the expert on that. You've got everything you need for the presentation. You've laid it out. You've got it formatted. Now you need to just practice rolling, getting it off, you know, to roll off the tongue. It's really like exercising a muscle. I mean, just saying these things out loud a couple times. Um, and, and, and again, I say this too about like interview answers and, and stuff that you're prepping for an interview. Uh, if you have a chance, um, do it in front of people. Give the presentation to in front of at least one person. Um, you know, stand up, deliver it in the format that you would be delivering it. It's, I'm sitting now because of this format. Uh, but typically, if I was practicing or rehearsing a presentation, I would try to stand and do it the way they would want it. Uh, I'd be doing it then. Work through it with your um, the technology that you're going to be using if you have the chance. Um, and then uh, another, another idea is to keep going. If you mess up and you trip up, even when you're practicing, just keep going, talk through it, because that's, you're not going to just start completely over in person when you're giving the presentation. People mess up and trip up when presenting all the time. Start kind of stuttering a little, forget where you are, lose your place, have to back up, um, digress because you forgot to mention something. It's not a big deal. It's really not a problem. You just kind of push through it and keep going. It has the potential to really mess people up. That's when they get really nervous. I've seen, if I had more time, I could give you some great stories of when I taught the class, some stuff I've seen where people have just kind of tripped up over something minor and then just let it turn into something much bigger than it needed to be. Um, you don't do this. It's okay. It's okay. We all trip over our words a little bit from here to there. I've probably done it 20 times during this presentation and you just kind of keep going. So do that when you practice as well. Don't mess up and then restart. Um, you know, just go for it. And then this is a huge one. Record yourself, if at all possible, even if you're talking through the presentation by yourself and you haven't been able to get somebody to come and be an audience for you, um, record it. That's a big, uh, it, it's really helpful to record. It's awkward and people don't like doing it. But if you go back and listen, you can hear if you're overusing jargon, um, and things that the audience might not understand. If you're using a lot of verbal fillers, the ums and uhs that we all use. Uh, if you're even not pronouncing words the right way, um, you're using cliches or overused words. That's a big one. Uh, when people kind of stick with, with cliches or keep kind of using the same words and language over and over, it can, can become distracting, can become noise if you go back to the idea from our, our context. Um, so really, I encourage you, Practice in front of people, if at all possible. Stand up, try to deliver it in the method you'll be delivering um, with the technology you'll be using. Keep going if you mess up, just practice doing that and record it and listen back to it a couple times. Oh. And then that's it. So I think we're pretty good on time here. I'm happy to open it up. I had actually closed the chat box here um, a little bit ago and now I've lost it. So uh, if there are any questions, Andy, if you want to let me know or if anybody yeah, has anything for me, uh, I'd love to, love to answer your questions. Nothing in the chat so far. Okay. 
I'm gonna go ahead and stop my uh, share here then. <laughs> I'm just now getting to see some of your reactions. Thanks for uh, thanks for rolling with me on the, the horrible joke. Well, I actually know, my grandpa actually did tell me that joke when I was a little kid. I never thought I'd be using it years later uh, when I was talking about public speaking. Um, okay, so Jason. Oh, sorry. Yes. Um, I have a question for you. So, sorry, yeah. like I didn't open up my video because my network is not right. No, no problem. But, right. So, um, one thing that, um, one reason that I feel nervous about my speech sometimes is that I, I'm afraid that I don't uh, sound confident enough or I don't sound like I don't have a beautiful voice or. I might get audience distracted and that is like something I always worried about during the presentation. Mm -hmm. so do you have any suggestions on that or do you have any thoughts on that? Sure, yeah, uh, great question. So I, I think that doing a lot of this work that I've talked about today will help with the anxiety. I didn't talk about that uh, a whole lot and actually tie it to the, the anxiety, um, but you know, the more prepared we are, uh, the better off we're going to feel going into it. That does not mean that you're going to be rid of anxiety altogether. Um, I give this example sometimes when I talk about this, and I, I know a guy, he was a, uh, just in his job, he one time sat down and did the math, and at this point years ago, and he's done a lot more since then, at the point when he sat and thought about this, he had realized that he had spoken in public, given public presentations over 10,000 times, okay? So way more than me, way more than any of us, I'm sure, I'm guessing. Um, and also some of the groups that he would be in front of would be 10, 20,000 people, which I've never spoken to a group that size. Um, so he had done this a lot. And what he found interesting was about, about this was over 10,000 presentations to huge audiences, he still felt that lump in his throat and still felt nervous going into every single time. So I'm saying that to tell you, like, don't feel bad that you still feel nervous. Don't feel like you're lesser of a public speaker because people that I know that are, are really experts on it, like really do it a lot, um, still get that, that nervous feeling. So all you can do is understand that that's an anxiety for you, which is great. Um, and then do everything you can to be prepared in every way possible ahead of time. And I promise that it will, it, you will not feel completely unnervous. Okay. You'll still have that a little bit, um, but it will, it will help you for sure. And then, you know, you just kind of harness that. I think if people are too comfortable public speaking, then the speeches can come across kind of boring and like they don't care on the, the care about the topic. So I think a little bit of nervous energy, um, keeps us upbeat and helps us engage with the audience a little bit better. And typically, once we get rolling and get started, a lot of those nerves shed away anyway. So just know that you know you don't feel don't feel bad about that. That's extremely natural. Um, I'm sure you're doing a lot better than you feel like you're doing. Um, just prepare uh, and 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 you know do your absolute best, and then um, and and you'll feel you'll feel great. Thank you. That's really good advice. Good. I hope it helps. Thanks. Two more questions in the chat. Uh, Cherish asked, what do you think about some traditional advice about public speaking, uh, such as imagine the audience in their underwear? <laughs> I've, never, I've never like given that advice or practiced this. I mean, I know that we hear that, that that's a thing. I mean, whatever, whatever works for you. I'm much more into um, the, the preparation ahead of time than depending on like tricks like that. I do think, now something that I do, especially when I'm speaking in front of a large group, um, I do identify a few people in the audience that are providing like really good feedback, um, kind of like nonverbal feedback. They seem engaged. They are giving kind of like friendly uh, feedback. They're nodding and going along with it. I don't just pick one because then you don't want to put them in an awkward position where you're just watching them the entire time. But I try to identify a few of those and I just kind of talk 
more to them. Now, if we had more time and we we're going into this in more depth, we'd be talking about, you know, scanning the audience, really trying to make eye contact, not just looking at your paper, not just looking at one person, but assuming all that, you kind of practice that and you're good at kind of looking across, identify the folks that are giving you um, good nonverbal feedback and just kind of make it into a conversation between them. Again, I'll say it again, because I think this is important, without singling one person out and just staring at them the whole time because then I've been that person and I give I think I give a lot of nonverbal feedback when someone's speaking and I've had people that are on the stage speaking just end up staring directly at me the entire time um, and then I kind of got distracted and uncomfortable so the underwear thing sure like if that works for you that's great um, I'm not opposed uh, but I have better luck preparing and then identifying the right people in the audience to talk to Awesome. Before we go on to the next question, I also have something to say about this. Sure. I don't know about the other glasses wearers, but like I used to do musical theater a little bit and I'd take off my glasses when I performed so I couldn't see people looking at me and it helped mm -hmm. a lot. So um, Interesting, maybe yeah. that works. Um, yeah, and the yeah, next question is how do you field questions that you don't know the answer to? Say you don't know it. I mean, it's okay. We're not supposed to be experts. I, I, I feel lucky that I find, I find, I kind of do this naturally. I don't have a problem um, just saying that, that I'm not sure of the answer. So what I would do, if somebody asked me a question and I didn't know the answer, I just say, you know, I don't know all the details on that. I haven't gotten there. If it's the appropriate setting, you can ask if anyone else in the room knows the answer. Okay. Like, does anybody else here know more about this? Um, and see if you can make it more into a conversation if anybody else is willing to speak up. Or if it makes more sense, you just say, I don't have all of that information. I'm not sure of the answer. Um, I'm going to write that down. You make a note. I can look it up and I can get that to you after the presentation. So that's maybe more likely, you know, if you're presenting out in a, um, for a, an internship or something like that, a project you've been working on, and you get asked a question that's just not part of the work that you put into it. I think it's okay to own it. I mean, it can be a little bit uncomfortable, right? You don't want to say you don't know and you're speaking to your boss and your boss's boss, but I, I'm a believer that that's better than um, just faking it and just giving them an answer that's not correct. Um, I think it's obvious to people when you actually don't know the answer and you're just kind of fumbling through it. Um, so yeah, different ways to handle it. If you can loop in other members of the audience, ask for volunteers who might know the topic, I think that that's great. Enoch asks, what do you recommend for body language during public speaking? I've heard conflicting advice about how you should walk around the stage or just try to stand still. Yeah, um, it's, it's tricky, right? I mean, you, a lot of people, it's pretty natural um, to use your hands when you talk. I mean, if I don't have to be holding something, I tend to walk around a little bit. Um, I think with practice, I've done that a little more naturally, but it's going to depend on the greater context. Like, are you going to have cards that you're working from where you kind of need a podium? If you're using a podium and need to have cards to kind of keep you on track for the extemporaneous style talk, then you're probably going to just kind of stand there between the podium, stand there behind the podium. Um, I, when I'm using a, um, a PowerPoint presentation, and I don't know if you all can see me, but you know, it's kind of behind me and I'm over here to the side. Um, I'll kind of still, I'll move around on the side of the room that I'm on, um, especially if I'm answering questions, I'll kind of scan and walk around the front of the room, but that can go too far. If it's coming across as a nervous energy, um, then it's not, it, it might not be great. It could also be distracting if it's just too much movement. So that I think is you just kind of have to find your balance and do, you want to land wherever is most natural to you. I, I, you're probably hearing conflicting answers and I'm probably giving you more. Um, just because I think it's a matter of opinion, but it's huge. That's a great way uh, or a great reason on why you should record yourself with video, if at all possible, get up in front of the room um, and give that presentation and see what you're doing. If you're noticing that your hands are in your pockets a lot, you'll learn from that and you'll be able to keep them out. If you're you know, keeping your arms folded or you're going too much talking with your hands that you think could be distracting, then you want to tone it down. So I don't, I think that there's a balance between being too rigid and stiff and then being moving around so much that you're a distraction and you want to kind of find in the middle, but practice, give a speech to your, you know, to yourself or maybe to a friend or two, have them record you and see how it looks. And our final question for today, 
Uh, Rishi asks, what advice do you have for keeping the for keeping your audience engaged throughout a long presentation? Is it by asking questions, cracking jokes, or is there some mantra? Yeah, I think I do a little bit of both. I tend to keep things fairly light. I mean, maybe it also is just the type of presentations I give. I mean, it's not on um, extremely heavy topics where I can't joke around some. Um, so I, I do, I, and I really try to keep it conversational. I don't, you know, it's, it's hard in this context, but if we were doing this in person, I would have been looping you all in a lot more um, to, to weigh in on some of this stuff, not throwing out like really tough questions to put anybody on the spot, but just asking, you know, for feedback, tell me about an example of an impromptu speech that you've given, things like that, stuff that people can speak to and stay engaged, um, while still knowing that naturally our brain processes words faster than anyone can say them. So you have to know that at certain times, your audience's mind is going to wander. There's no way that they're going to focus and know every word that you said. So like, as I'm talking to you, I'm talking about 70 words a minute. You all are able to compute something like around 400 words a minute. So your brain is faster than my words. So your attention is going to kind of slip away from time to time. Knowing that that's something to consider when you're giving a presentation. If you're getting to an extremely important point or something that you really know that you want them to be engaged, just say that, say, all right, now I want everyone to really focus and come back to me on this one. Pay attention to this. This is a really extremely important part that you need to hear. Say it, build it in. If there's a point, because you got to recognize that maybe 25% of your audience at any given moment is going to be a little bit out of focus on what you're saying. So just draw them back in. And then, you know, you build in your transitions. All right, we're going to move down to the third and final point. We're wrapping up. And anytime, anything you say like that um, is going to kind of re-engage them. But if you can build in conversation, some humor, some questions for the audience, I think that that's great. It takes a little bit of practice, but it's, it goes a long way. Great questions, you all. Thank you. All right. Great. Thank you so much, Jason. That was an excellent presentation. You learned a lot. I think you fielded the questions really well and it was flexible. So I um, really you. appreciate that. Thank you all for joining us today.